the brain isn't going to go, okay, well, I can't really abuse this because this is only for a physical situation. And the brain doesn't go, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm using this because it's not conscious. Trust me, the disease of addiction is much more stealth. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I knew I was going to either do that or choke. Um, so what we did was we started looking at efficacy of pain medication because in pharmaceutical, I told, I don't want it. <laughs> pharmaceutical companies are going to encourage it and they're going to justify it. And doctors absolutely know with chronic care patients, absolutely, you don't want them to suffer or have pain. I didn't want my mother to suffer. It was her choice not to take it, but I didn't want her to suffer. So this is the efficacy of pain, Ms. If this gets out, it's going to be a problem. Two Percocet pills. When we looked at people who were saying they were getting at least 50% of pain relief by taking two Percocet pills, you had about 38% say, yeah, that was good. I feel better. Well, what if I don't give you a narcotic, but I give you ibuprofen, Advil? Well, what? It's the same efficacy? Well, wait a minute. What if I give you 400 milligrams? Still, not a scheduled narcotic, not highly addictive. Actually, the purpose is to take down the swelling of the injury and help with the healing. Uh-uh. <laughs> well, wait a minute, but oxys, that's what I always hear about. Oxy, that's, that's better. That's going to be better. Wait a minute. So why are they prescribing it? Well, okay, but what if you take Tylenol? Tylenol, surely, or an acetaminophen. Well, it's actually more effective. So then, you know, these doctors and nurses, and by the way, it was a nurse who gave me this, are far more intelligent. They said, you know what you want to do? Mix the acetaminophen with the ibuprofen, and that's your efficacy. So why are we prescribing it? It's ideal for chronic pain. But for acute pain, which is a quick injury, maybe three to five days at most. Writing a 30-day script could be writing a death script. We look at treatment emissions. I'm going to go through this quick. This was in 2001. Is this on? Okay. This, this was in 2001. So red counties, those were the ones we were worried about. You can see up here Wood County, 4.4%, right? 2001. Oh my God, 2014. The entire state is in an epidemic. This is considered a health crisis. So then we say, well, wait a minute. Let's look at hospital emissions. That's just treatment. How many people are having issues with the disease who are going into hospitals? Now, mind you, I didn't know this. Not every county has a hospital. I know that sounds simple, but I genuinely didn't know. So again, we're looking at a weighted average from 2004 to 2008. And we're saying, that's my daughter. Text him. <laughs> this is 2009 to 2013. So I can't sit in any meeting anywhere and say, well, I mean, it's getting better. It's not, and it won't get better because the progression of the disease means there are going to be people who are currently becoming addicted, who are continuing to progress in the disease, who without intervention, those numbers are likely to go up. So here's Wood County. We looked at the hepatitis C in 2011. Wood County, for every 10, 100,000, had, I believe, 11.1 .1 cases of hepatitis. Well, how does this play into it? Um, hepatitis C in 2013 went up to 48 people per 100,000. That's an increase. How is that happening? Because of the infectious disease. Because a lot of times when you're sitting there ready to bang dope, what you're doing is thinking, I'll just clean it with a little bit of a cigarette thing and alcohol. You're still infecting other people with the disease of hepatitis C or HIV. It's actually pretty rampant in Southwest Ohio and traveling its way up um, the 70, 70 and 71 corridor. So the one thing I want to do is leave you with hope. We actually went down, since addressing the prescribing, we've gone, eight, gone down 81 million pills from 2011 to 2015. Well, what does that mean? It means that in 2014, for every man, woman, and child in the state, you could have had 62 pills for every man, woman, and child. In all of Europe, 
which is France, Italy, Belgium, Germany, Spain. It's two pills. Because we as Americans have determined that we don't, we don't suffer. And we're too good to feel pain. And whatever I want, I want it now. I want instant gratification. My phone says I get it. My computer says I get it. Take away my pain. But sometimes the apex of pain is where healing begins, both physically and emotionally. So as a community, we have to think beyond this is a choice. I'm telling you it's not, it's a disease. This young woman, you can see her mugshot. Instead of seeing her as a disease, see her as a person, and a person who is in recovery, who is supported by a tremendous community. You can research her story. Which one are you? And this is where I say you have to be honest, and I'm going to wrap up here in two minutes. Which one are you with regard to the stigma of addiction? Are you the one who says, well, you know what? She smokes marijuana, and I just drink, so she's nasty. Or, you know what, he likes to do eight balls and I just like to do pills, so he's nasty. So we have stigma amongst the disease of addiction, which further divides. Or are you the one from the treatment provider perspective, and I know, Lori, we've all dealt with it, where we have people in the treatment system who says, well, I don't believe in medicated-assisted treatment. I don't believe they should have Vivitrol or buprenorphine or, or methadone. Well, you can't have it both ways. You can't say it's a disease and then say, but you don't have a choice to take a medication. It's either a disease or it's not. And science has already proven it's a disease. And as a diabetic and a woman who is dealing with depression, do not give me a Fexer or tell me that's the only thing that I'm allowed to take and I better be off of it in two years. We would not tolerate that. But because we've isolated people with the disease of addiction, we feel like we can control them because they make bad choices. No, they have a disease, and we need to empower them to make healthy choices. The last one is the stigma from the community because they lack the knowledge to understand the disease. And so they make statements. You know, we had massive campaigns when we were using the word retarded and fag. We do the same thing with the disease of addiction, and we need to. That person is struggling, that person is overcoming, that person is recovering. And we should support that person. If you want to open the door to the truth of disease, the disease, it is a chronic progressive condition that can ultimately lead to death. Cancer has the same definition. Diabetes has the same definition. We can't continue to shame human beings who have this disease. And we can't continue to assume that it's a, a disease or condition that is only affecting those who are impoverished, who are poor, who are stupid, who are uneducated, who are trash. Because what my statistics tell me is overwhelmingly they're male between the ages of 24 and 44. They are white, the majority having at least a high school education, many with a college education. If you think you have been inoculated against this disease, you are wrong. You are wrong. You can quote me. You can say, well, that's what she said, but I want to investigate. Go ahead and investigate it. I strongly encourage you to look at the data. These are a number of programs that we have at the state that are working. Our addiction treatment programs for drug courts are working so well in the state that we moved from 15 counties. We've expanded it to seven more counties. We're telling people medication-assisted treatment is acceptable. We're telling people, if you don't think you need medication, that's cool too. Tell us what you do need so we can support you with it. We're working with moms to help them with neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is giving birth to a child who has the opiate in their system at birth. Now before, when it was previous, we called it crack baby. We knew that was a mistake. So we've now found, by getting them stable housing, giving them medication-assisted medicated -assisted treatment, you decrease the amount of time the child spends in the ICU, and you increase the likelihood of that person being sustained in recovery. This is my information. My email is on the bottom. If you have any questions, if you want further data, absolutely call me. What I will tell you is this community, Wood County, and I will give kudos to 
the Prevention Coalition, the Adams Board, the Health Department, the Sheriff, and Bowling Green State University. They have not hidden their heads in the sand with this issue. And they haven't tried to isolate or profile any one individual. I thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm humbled to be asked again. And I thank you and appreciate your respect so much, and I hope I've given you the same. Thank you.